Okay, this is the Young County Museum of History and Cultures. This is oral history, Mr. James Jackson. So, uh, Mr. Jackson, could you please identify yourself by your name, your age, and where you live? Uh, my name is James Virgil Jackson, 75 years old, and I live here in Graham, Texas. I was born here in Graham, Texas. My mother was a housewife, a maid. My daddy was a janitor at the Graham General Hospital for 42 years. It was four boys in my family, me being next to the youngest. My oldest brother, Herbert, next to the oldest, Ernie, then James, and then my youngest brother, Roby, John Roby Jackson. He lived in, youngest brother, he's living in Fort Worth. Ernest, next to the oldest, he's currently living in Graham. My oldest brother, he passed away at age 14. But I attended Lincoln School. And uh, this school was one room, one teacher, eight grades. Some days you might have class. Some days you didn't. And we, the school is still currently standing here in Graham. It's located off uh, Loving Highway, right there to the right where they have this uh, little old restaurant. It's a green looking building sitting right there, right beside where it's, it used to be the old Methodist church. It sits right there beside it. In 19... 58, they built us a new school for blacks. And Where is it located? it's located up there, right up on the side of the mountain, there off of where Billy Fred Acres. And uh, at that time, we had three rooms, running water in the bathroom, <laughs> and three teachers. We thought we had it made. Were your teachers black or white? They was all black. Okay. Uh, Miss Hallie Rose Grace, Dorothy Jean Lane, and Benny Lane. They all three taught me. So uh, uh, that school was only supposed to go to the eighth grade. Once the kids got in the ninth grade, their parents had to found them a school outside of Grimm. My brother stayed with my older brother, which was from my mother's oldest son. He lived in Fort Worth. So, and the other girl, she went to Wichita Falls to Booker T. Washington. Her parents were the camels. Her dad owned a body shop here, Speedy. And uh, she went to Wichita Falls. Well, my brother was went to a Como High School in Fort Worth, and he enrolled in September of '57. On January the twenty-third, he passed away at the age of fourteen. Wow. We don't actually know. They never did get, some said it was sickle cells, because my mother had traces, and, uh, but he didn't last long after he got sick. Well, the next year, my other brother, he uh, went to Wichita Falls to stay with some people, no relatives, no nobody, but he didn't like it up there, so they decided to bring all of them back, since we had a three-room school and two teachers. And then that's when Benny Lane got out the military and Mr. Lane was the third teacher. So they had them all back here. For from, high school? For high school, the school went from first grade. We had three rooms, four, four classes in one room, four classes. Miss Lane had four classes. And Mr. Mr. Lane 
had four classes. So in 1963, they announced that the schools in Graham, which Graham was one of the first schools in West Texas to integrate. Because when I went off to college, I'll get to that later. <laughs> they integrated the school in Ida. They integrated the school from the ninth grade through the twelfth grade. At that time, I was a senior, a senior, and lost. All of the most of the black kids, some of them didn't even attempt to go to the high school. And out of all the kids that went to the Graham High School, only five end up getting a diploma. I had a teacher named Miss Willie Allen. She was an English teacher. My little brother, he went to summer school two years trying to pass it. So I decided I didn't pass it. I was supposed to be in a, a class of 64, but since I couldn't pass English, I decided I was going to quit. And then that's when my parents gave me three options. Go to school, go to work, or get out. So I chose to go back to school. So I ended up graduating, and I was the first black to receive a diploma from Graham High School. So you participated in the sports during my, that time. My senior year, and I was on... I, I participated in football, baseball, and I ran track. And at that time, we was ranked number one in state. And I tell this story a lot when, uh, at that time, a team up on the Panham called Dumas was ranked number one in state. We went up to play Dumas in Borger, Texas. The game was a Saturday afternoon game, and uh, we left Friday, not knowing that they didn't allow blacks in hotel. We had a basketball coach named Coach McMillan. He was the head basketball coach, which he won state in basketball that same year. With the green team? With the green team from Graham High School. What year was that, sir? That was in, the app was a 63-64 year. We got beat in football semifinals against Corsicana with 33 seconds left on the clock. We got beat 13-14. But when we went to play Dumas in Borga, Coach McMillan, he snuck me into his room, and that's where I stayed. I couldn't go outside with PD, EA, Garden, Freddy, Goff, and stuff because I was kind of felt like they was hiding me, which they were. But the game was the next day, and we won it 13, 13 to nothing, I think the score was. But uh, that was an experience. And I remember the first time that I actually walked in the front door of a restaurant. It was in Abilene, Texas. We played the Abilene Eagles uh, scrimmage game. And Coach Curry, he took, it was me and my little brother and another kid named James Camel. He quit school. My little brother, he flunked out of football. But, and I was, somehow or another, I was able to keep my grades up until I played the whole season. I ran track and I played baseball. But it was in Abilene when I first walked inside of a place to eat. And I just, when my head coach died, Coach Curry, he was from Bowie, Texas, which when we played Bowie in football, they wouldn't feed us. We stood out in the front of Coach Curry's mother's house and drank tea before the game because they would not let feed us in the restaurant because my little brother and me was on the team. But my coach, Curry, he refused to leave my brother's home. He said, they either comment or you forfeit the game. And me and my brother went. Of course, they called us all kind of racial slurs and everything you can name. But we beat the hell out of them. 
<laughs> there is justice. And 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 my father, my mother, she was a kind of a she was different from my dad. Well, my dad was so scared of us going to school. We weren't allowed to talk to white girls. And when we went to play and boo and my dad said, Well, you think we ought to let the boys go? And my mother, my mother was crazy about some P.D. Chabay and E.A. Grisham, Garden East and all them. And she said, well, P.D. and E.A. and them, they'll take care of them. And sure enough, they asked my mother, are you going to Bowie? And my mother would tell them, if them boys go, I'm going. And my mother and father was escorted in Bowie, Texas, by the superintendent, Mr. Heffner. And they watched the game there in Bowie. And, um, of course, uh, it, was, it, it, it was tough. It was really tough. I mean, we had nothing to look forward to at going to the old school. Because there wasn't nothing here to do. We didn't know nothing about no prom or going to the canteen. All that was out. But, you know, and I guess... After high school, I went to college at Cisco Junior College. And then I transferred to Midwestern State University. Then Uncle Sam had more interest in me than I did myself. So I went into the military. What brain? I was in the Army. I was, you know, doing the Vietnam. And, uh, well, I was a personnel specialist. I typed up Article 15 because I took typing. Once I couldn't graduate, I went back to Graham High School for another year, and I took up typing some and speech that that actually helped me along. I put I said this here, though two years that I went to Graham High School, I learned more than I learned. 11 years that I was in the other school. Of course, I could read. I could spell a little. I could write. But, you know, there's a lot of things that I didn't know anything about it because Miss Lane and Mr. Lane, they'd done an outstanding job with what they had to work for, with. And some of the kids, and I guess that's the reason I strive for my kids. I have four children. And uh, I scratch and I put them college all well three of them one of them have their master degree and they all have a pretty good job and that's reading I strive to make sure that they get an education but you know it was hard for me and like I said I'm not the smartest guy well I'm not the dumbest either but <laughs> I just managed to get by you know my my granddaughter she goes to TCU, and she was crying because she made a, a B plus. And I said, I was glad to get a D. I try to make the grade points up in, in PE, <laughs> if it was possible. But, you know, it, it was just a lot of things we went through. And, you know, when I took the job at the power plant. When did was, you get that job? I went to work for the power plant in 71. And that's after you got out of the military? That's after I got out of the military. I come, after I got out of the military, I cut grass. Of course, I got married one day and went overseas the next day. Oh. Now, who, what's your wife's name? My wife was uh, named Willie May. Okay. And, of course, she had two children when I married. Lasagna Coleman. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, she's my okay. stepdaughter. Okay. And her sister, Larkita McCullins. Well, Los Angeles, she's still in Larry. They live here in Graham now. But um, I stress, you know, they all went to college. My oldest, next to the oldest daughter, she was on the dean list. That's the one my granddaughter goes to TCU. But, you know, I went to Midwestern, and that's when I, that's where I was going to school when I was drafted. And uh, they found out that I had a little college background, which made it easier for me because I was a personnel specialist. And I worked in the audit room, and that was a plus in my behalf because I didn't have to make formation in the morning. I didn't have to pull a KP. <laughs> so I stayed there, and they gave me some help in the audit room. But 
When I come back here, I started out at the power plant as a janitor. Then I got a promotion to building and ground custodian, where I cleaned the building and cut the yard. So uh, I finally, they sent me to a mechanical repairman school. And from that, I was, they actually, all the guys got promoted until it come my time. And they just passed me by. And uh, of course, I didn't want to raise a stink or nothing, but I actually asked them why. But you know, I'm a person to believe if it ain't on paper, it didn't happen. So I had done my homework. But my old next to the oldest daughter, she graduated from North Texas University of North Texas. And of course she went on back and got her master's and stuff. And now she's currently she teaches in Plano ISD. And all my children, I, I, I've been blessed. You know, they are all got an education. You know, I guess they looked and saw what I was doing. Because when I started to work, they used to tease my kids because I tried to do the very best I could, have the nicest things. And some of the kids would tell my kids at high school, your daddy must be a dope pusher. But cause I would buy new cars. My wife worked. And, and they we went to school here in Graham? All of my, yes. Okay. Well, three out of the five. Okay. And my youngest one, she, uh, she graduated from college in 2014. And they all live in the Metroplex. So when you got went to work out there at the power plant and everybody else got promoted above you, you asked why? Yes. And uh, no one could tell me. I went through my chain of command because, oh, military, you go through your chain of command. Well, when nobody could give me an answer that I wanted to hear, I went to the federal building in Dallas to the EEOC. So they asked me, well, what kind of money are you asking for? And I told them up front, I'm not looking for no money. I just want to be treated like the rest of the guys. Well, when they finally made a position for me as a planner and scheduler, and then I moved up to support supervisor. But when I left, I was the highest paid other than another guy named Gene Carter. You know Gene Carter? Well, see, Gene Carter, he's a plant manager now out in West Texas. He and I was the highest paid supervisors at thanks to Greg Stuckey. <laughs> so what made you leave the plant that's here? The plant in 19, no, 2005, we had a maintenance program called PRISM. And I was by far the sharpest one at the plant on that program. So we had some lignite plants down in East Texas. So Greg Stuckey sent me to uh, East Texas to a plant at called Monticello, Monticello Power Plant, a lignite plant. So he said, well, it'll be about six months. Well, that six month turned into two years. So after I got back, they was building two more big night plants down in Robinson County out from Waco. So they sent me down there and they said, well, it'd be about eight months. I went down there in 07. I got back in 2012. I was down there about five years. But since I left there, I've been on and off. They were still, I done some right because they still called me back mm -hmm. as a project manager and stuff. But, you know, I just always believe anything worth having is worth working for. And of course, Yes, I've been blessed because I'm 75 years old and I have never spent a night in a jail. All of my kids have never been to the pen. And that's a blessing in nowadays. You're that don't happen. Right. That don't happen nowadays. You were raised right and it sounds like you raised them right. Well, yeah. I got them out of my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, well, we went through this so fast. I want to go back to... Uh, did you ever go to school prior to high school anywhere else? No. So you did all your education? I've done all right? my education here in Graham. Okay. 
What was it like being a, a kid living in Graham? Well, we didn't have much to do. Uh, it went out. We used to live out here where the old hospital used to be. Okay. It's, and right across the street, well, uh, Kent Pettis owned that building there. It used to be an old nursing home. Yes, sir. Used to be the hospital there. And it was a house there where I grew up at. And then we moved to uh, where, uh, down to the, uh, what they call the flats. Yes, sir. Okay. In 53. And then I was going to that one room school and I went there until 57. And that's when they built the new, the other school and I attended that until they integrated. And it was walking distance from where you lived? Yes. Yes. I lived on Loving Road and the school was on, was, which is 380, right across the street from the cemetery. Okay. Right next to the black cemetery. Where uh, I think what his name uh, uh, got a gravel business there, Kirkland, yes. Archie Kirkland. He's got that property now. Okay. But our school was right next to the cemetery. Oh, okay. How many kids were in the class your age when they integrated schools? My senior year, there was one, two, three. Four. About six. There was Roby, Zeke, Arlita, Ethel, but they all dropped out except me and my brother and Arlita. Of course, Arlita moved and she finished school in Waco. But the other black kids, some of them didn't even attempt to go because they knew they, they was not academic, you know, ready. And, you know, and if I'd had my choice, I probably wouldn't have went. But, but my parents, would, they wouldn't go for it because I guess they knew because, like I said, one of them had a, you know, you get homework and you go home and you ask your mom or dad a question. and they have no idea what you're talking about because they did not have the education to help you. So we was out there. But here's a little story I'll tell you that how I actually got out of high school. I've never. <laughs> Miss Allen, well, English was kept me from graduating, which I couldn't have graduated had I passed it. No way, because coming from Lincoln School, we did not have enough credits in the first place to be a senior and graduate. So therefore, I was going to have to go back another year to get enough credits to graduate. But my little brother went to summer school, and I refused him to go to summer school. So I went back to school another year, which he flunked summer school. And then he went back another year, too. Well, while he was in summer school, Miss Willie Allen, she made you keep a, a notebook in English. And you had to turn them in at the end of the school. Well, my little brother, Roby, found P.D. Chabay's notebook, and that was the Bible. <laughs> that got me out of high school. I have never shared this with P.D., but, you know, we still keep in contact and stuff. But that's what happened. Because Miss Allen was a teacher. She would teach the same plane every year. Okay. And when we come to that, I, the dates on the deal, I know, well, I will study PD because he was on the dean's uh, well on the National Honor Society, right. and uh, that got me out of high school. <laughs> and then I took it from there, and you know, and went on to college. And of course, I was a junior in college when uh, I got drafted. What were you uh, trying to get a degree in when you went? Business and administration. But uh, that's kind of gone. Computers and stuff like that. That's kind of a deal of the past now. What was your parents' opinion of you going to college? Did they push you to do it? or? Well, my parents, they didn't have much. And uh, I have never spent a night on a college campus. When I was going, I started out going to Cisco Junior College. They had a bus 
that would pick us up up here by the driver's hotel every morning. And we would ride that bus to Cisco and uh, ride it back home. Well, on Friday, if I got out of class early, I would hitchhike home. And then once I'd done that for a couple of years, and then I went to Midwestern, and I'd schedule my classes on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I would drive back and forth from Graham to Wichita Falls on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then until I got drafted, and, you know, I didn't go back after I come out to the military. I went to work because I was married and had a kid on the way, and I had to go to work. I mean, there wasn't no, there wasn't no going back to school. But my parents, they pushed us because they know they didn't have it. And I guess that bled off on me when I pushed my kids. And, uh, you know, my kids, I, I, I guess you might say I was old school because I guess where I got it from, and a lot of people hate to hear me say what I'm going to say. But my daughter, they want to go to HBUC schools. I was very much against it because I looked at, when I went to Cisco, my two years at Graham High School made, I was above some of the black students from Dunbar, Carol Patrick High in Fort Worth, Booker T. Washington out of Marlin. And I was just that for a hit. And I kept, I kept that in my head when my kids got out of college. So I said, no, if you go there, you pay for it yourself. <laughs> but, you know, I struggled. I borrowed money. And uh, sadly, HPV. David Bowden, mm -hmm. they, 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 they gave me, and Jim Underwood, they loaned me money and I would pay it back and stuff like that just to get my kids and I depleted my 401k. But when they got out, I don't get no bills from no college. They all paid in full. I don't have nothing, but, you know, my kids, if I need something, they're there for me. Did you have a best friend growing up? Yeah, I had a best friend. Well, I'm going to tell you something strange. I had a friend here. His name was James Thomas Smith. And I don't know if you guys, y'all might remember a guy named D.V. Hood. D.V. Hood used to run a service station at, uh, up here on 4th Street. Anyway, he had a, uh, uh, I guess he was some kin to his wife. His name was James Thomas Smith. Well, it was another guy named Ben Johnson lived in Ollady. Well, is they had a, a nephew or something. His name was James Thomas Smith. So I went to a funeral about a year ago to one of my old classmates in Ollady, and his sister was there, and I haven't heard from him in sixty years. And what really shocked me, she said, he's still living. He lived in Nashville, Tennessee. Well, I couldn't wait to get on my phone to call him. Mm -hmm. But he didn't remember me. Oh. And that was kind of a slap in the face because I couldn't understand because it wasn't but a handful of blacks here in the first place. Yeah. And, uh, but he could remember the camels, the bucks, uh -huh. and... Uh, but he didn't remember none of the Jacksons. Huh. And I said, well, I still got his number, but I didn't bother him no more. Yeah. And it, it's kind of, I said, how can he not remember me? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but he didn't. We talked about things that went on here back when he was here. And he remembered that, all that stuff, you know, his grandmother and stuff. But, you know, he didn't remember none of the Jacksons. And I guess it was four, four of us, four boys. We had to, well, probably the biggest family with four boys. And, and other than the camels, it was three of them. And the bucks, it was three of them. And two nobles, and that was about it. 
was it easy for you to integrate into the high school here? Uh, yes and no. And what I say about that, I started, they integrated school in 63. In 1956, 55, they started Little League here in Grimm in 54. Well, at that time, blacks couldn't play. We had a judge, Mr. Johnson, and he said if the blacks couldn't play, there will not be a Little League organization in Grimm. So I knew most of the males that I went to school with, P.D., Gardeners, Freddie Mayo, I mean, uh, Freddie Goff, and all of those guys, you know, I knew them. Pete Wood, you know, Gary Crenshaw, all of those guys. I knew them because I've been playing baseball from, I guess, 54 up until, you know, I was in the Babe Ruth League. So I knew them all. But for the girls, my daddy being from Mississippi, we wasn't allowed, you know. Of course, one of my favorites uh, was uh, Sarah K. Williamson. Her mother was a home economic teacher at the high school in Yamaidra. Anyway, and we all meet together. I still go to the class reunion. We had our 55th class reunion. And, you know, it's, I, I mean, I've got comfortable as I got older to talking to them. And um, I guess Becky Shifflett, she was a secretary out there at the power plant. And, uh, her husband used to work at the Morrison's. Yeah, and I got comfortable, you know, and close friends right today. But it took you several years to get comfortable with talking to white girls. Yes, my daddy told us not to be talking to How them. long till you really could comfortably? How old do you think you might have been? I was working at the power plant. <laughs> That's when. So even and through was, the military. Not through the military. Well, yeah, well, I was in Germany, and, uh, you know, I talked to him over there, but, you know, I'm talking about back in the States, you know. And, uh, but, you know, we just wasn't allowed to do it because my daddy had seen so much in Mississippi and stuff, and, you know, he was afraid for us. And that was during the time Martin Luther King and, you know, and stuff. And uh, he was just scared for us, and we just didn't do it. And on Monday morning, Sarah Kay, he would put these banners on you, mm -hmm. and uh, she would walk up to me, and they wouldn't, they didn't, it didn't bother them. Uh, Sarah Kay and uh, Joanne Pettis, mm -hmm. she was one of our cheerleaders, and we are good friends right today. And they would come up to me, and they would pin that ghost ears and stuff, and I, my heart would just pound it. Because I was scared. Yeah. I was scared because all of the stuff you had seen on TV and stuff like that. And my daddy had instilled that in us. Yeah. And, it, you know, we didn't do it. Did you experience any of that here? No. Um, here in Graham, I had no racial problems at high school. Other than when I went out of town, you know. Because, like I said, all the teams that I played in football, it was only one team that had blacks on it. What team was that? Brownwood Lambs. Okay. They were the only team that had black, even Vernon. Well, didn't speaking have. of Vernon, this is the, uh, I'm going to kind of put it to the camera and then show you, the uh, oh, yeah. program I told you I found, <laughs> Graham versus uh, Vernon, uh -huh. 1963, and there you are. Uh, yeah, and my little brother. And see, that's uh, okay. That's Mike Copper, I think. Yeah, and here's his cheerleaders, and you know that's Peggy Snow, Sarah K. Williamson, Joanne Garen, uh, Sandra Schulz, Mary Graham, and uh, can't think of her name, but um. Yeah, they all, I still keep in contact with them all. That is Because Sarah Kay, she works for the same company that I did. I seen where she retired here a while back and stuff. But, you know, for us going to high school and stuff up there, we had no problem. No problem with 
the girls or the boys or nothing. And that's kind of shocking. I tell people today, I think things are worse today than they was 50 years ago. Yeah. In my eyesight, because, you know, cause that's when I, I graduated from school over 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have no problem. You know, ping golf, they would come and spend the night with Sam Satbury and stuff like that. It wasn't, and they would go to their houses and stuff. They were just like two brothers, yeah, black and white. I mean, it, it wasn't no color bearers back then. They was all colorblind. Yeah. But, you know, you face some stuff today, and I've experienced stuff, you know, today, where, you know. Do you just, think it's media-driven? Um, that's some some of it. It's just according to what station you, you listen to. You can yeah. listen at ESPN, MSNBC, or Fox, and you go get, you know, different. You know, sometimes it, it, it pays not to watch it. And just like the war. See, I... I watched it, the war going on, and it's so disturbing to me. So I, when I, I watch Jewish Judy when I can. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's just it's just heartbreaking. Yes, but you know, it, it's a different world now than it was when I coming up, and I just can't understand why did we go backwards. When you went to college in Cisco, uh, how big was your Oh, uh, they had a pretty good sized class there at Cisco because uh, they uh, uh, they had a, a bunch of well, sports only thing I was with most of the guys, but you know my classes was pretty good sized classes at Cisco. And uh, so the bus you said that left from Graham that went to Cisco it carried blacks and whites. Yes. Okay. Blacks and whites. Yeah. Girls and boys. Girls and boys. Yeah. Very good. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. It, it ran every day. That's, every day. That's pretty brilliant, was, actually. Was it a school bus? It was a white school bus. It had Cisco Junior College written on the side of it. That is pretty brilliant. And we would go there and, you know, doing a, a, doing class time we wasn't in class, we'd go to the bus, play cards. I'll play poker or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> One yeah. of my favorite things to ask is what you were doing uh, as far as occupation or in school when you met your wife. Well, my wife went to school, went to college at a place called Java Christian College. And uh, when I was in high school, she would help me. Well, sometimes she would write my theme papers uh -huh. in high school and college both. And uh, I had passing grades. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I can't let this get away. Yeah. So she went to school here in Graham? No, she no. didn't go to school here. She was, She went to uh, uh, Omaha. Omaha, Texas. That's from uh, uh, Mount Pleasant. Okay. Where'd y'all meet? Here in Graham. Okay. Her mother lived here in Graham. Okay. And she, she was adopted by uh, another family. Okay. And uh, she had, you know, two children when we met. And we got married in 68, November 11th, Veterans Day. Because I was determined to get married before I went overseas. But on Veterans Day, we went to Jacksboro. The courthouse was closed. Uh -huh. There was a guy here named Raymond Thomas. I don't know if you remember him, but he married us on, on uh, November the 11th. November the 12th, I was on a plane flying to Philadelphia to go to Frankfurt, Germany. And, uh, you know, she was married for 36 years. Okay. She passed away in, in 2001. But, like I said, you know, it was tough growing up, but it got better. 
And now that's where I have a problem with look like things are going backwards. And, you know, like I said, we didn't have nothing in high school to look for. We would we would go to the and pick cotton with my mother to make money to go to the state fair. Because we, blacks had one day, they call it Negro Achievement Day. And that day was in October around the 15th through the 17th, that Saturday. And you have schools, black schools from all over the state of Texas. And, uh, you know, that's what we look forward to. We would go and get cotton and make four or five dollars. And that's all we had. And that was a lot of money back there. And we would go to the state fair. And that's all we had to look forward to. How'd y'all get there? The school would would let us have a bus. Any lane would drive the bus. I believe it. And that's how we got there. But uh, before that, you know, my parents would, would drive up there on that day and that they had a high school, black schools, you know, Booker T. Washington, Jefferson High, Madison and stuff. The schools there in the Dallas area, black school, they would all play. And that night they had a, a game between uh, uh, Prairie View and Wiley College College game that night. And that was the highlight of the year. But, uh, you know, we would, you know, we would go to the movie. We had, well, at that time, we didn't, we couldn't go to the National Theater. We could go to, they had two theaters downtown, the Leon and the, uh, National. Well, we the blacks had to go upstairs. <laughs> at the Leon or the at National? The, at the Le we didn't go to the, didn't the National. Go we went to the Leon, but we went up. Had to go upstairs and sit. Hmm. And that's we would go there. I think it cost about a dime to get in back then. But <laughs> mm -hmm. where was the Leon located at? It used to be right there on the corner. It used to be a drugstore called Mark Jones. The, the 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 Leon Theater was right next door to it, and then, of course the National is in the same place that it was back then. I knew about the one called the Liberty, but I didn't know about the Liberty. Liberty. Yes, sir. Where the Vogue is now, uh, right there next to uh, Marshall King and Henson's old building. I don't guess I remember it. Was it on Oak Street? Yeah. The okay. Leon? Leon I don't know. It's the same theater. They it's might have. It yeah. used to be Leon when I was when I was a kid. Yeah. Okay. It's probably the same thing. Yeah. yeah. What's your favorite childhood memory? Uh -huh. Well, I guess when they integrated school, none of the blacks had played football. I had nothing but sandlot football. Benny Lane would get out there, and we would. We we would try to we would tackle him just to get better because he was our teacher. But uh, I remember when uh, we was playing Mineral Wells baseball, and uh, Coach Mullins put me in as a pinch hitter, and I hit a double off the wall. And scored the win and run. Oh, that's cool. And I think about it all the time. E.A. Grisham was the win and run. I hit a double off the wall. And that memory has stuck with me ever since. Who were y'all playing? Mineral Wells. In Mineral Wells. And, uh, you know, like I said, football. And it was hard to, you couldn't start, none of the blacks could start in football. Because Graham at that time was ranked number two in state. Till we beat Dumas, and then we went to number one in state. But you know, none of the blacks had played no kind of regulation, nothing but tag, tag football. But when it came to baseball, all the kids on the high school baseball team, I played little league all star with them, so I was just as good as they were when it come to baseball. Yeah. But uh, and my brother, my youngest brother, he was very good, but he couldn't play because his grades. 
But, what about uh, track? So I ran track. Ah, that's a different story. We uh, uh the guy named Joe Bill Bennett. I don't know oh, if yeah. he had a brother named Jim Bob that got killed. They used to stay out here by the women's club back in the day. Well, you know, oh, country club. It used to be the old country club. Mm -hmm. Well, we would go out there and we're supposed to run the nine holes cross country run, getting in shape for the track meet. The first track meet we had, Coach Slater, he said, well, James, you go run the quarter. Well, the 440 back then. And uh, that was the toughest race on the track with a quarter of a mile. So I was running a quarter, and I could hear my teammates hollering, Go, James, go, James. Well, after I ran about, I led the whole group, you know, till I got about 330 yards. Then somehow or another, I picked that piano up. <laughs> <laughs> And then I ended up finishing dead last, and I just fell down, and I just rolled off the track. Then here come my coach, and he told me to get up. Well, I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't get up. So that Monday, I turned my track stuff in, and that was all of my track right then. I went to one meeting, but you know, I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> take it. But baseball and football, I hung in there with football and baseball. I still have my. Patch from high school at semifinals champ. Oh, that's cool. And uh, still got my old Graham, my old G. What's your favorite memory with the children? Oh, one of my favorite memories is uh, my daughter and son, they took it school for granted there for a while. And they both, well, my son, he he he, he uh, flunked the course. Well, at that, that time, they didn't teach. They didn't have summer school in Graham. So I don't know if I was punishing them or what, but I sent them to Fort Worth Dunbar okay. to summer school. One of the best things I have ever done. When they come back, Graham High School was so far above. They was A students at Dunbar. When they could barely, was barely getting by, he had Grimm. And my daughter, she went through college on the dean list. And my son, he did not graduate because he never did get the English down. He, all he liked him was getting English. Well, my youngest daughter, she went through, she went to Texas State University. But all of my children, I I guess I took them for granted because my oldest, my next to the oldest daughter, Stacy, she uh, went to what the International Aviation Academy, and then they she moved to uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and she got in there. One of her roommates was doing drugs and stuff, so I brought her back home, and I was determined. I figured my children wasn't no smarter than me, but I was so wrong. So you can't never, don't never, children are smarter than what you give them credit for. Okay. So I said, well, no, you all is going to a junior college. I'm going to find out if you guys are college material. So they went to Navarra Junior College. And then they left there and went to University of North Texas. My youngest daughter, she went to Weatherford Junior College. And then she transferred there and went to Texas State University down in a, outside of St. Marcus, I guess where it was. And they are all doing very well. And, uh, you know, it, I think a lot of that was a drive that I had because I didn't get it. And, and uh, I was making sure, and my daughter, you know, she turned down jobs for most of it. That's my youngest brother. His daughter, see, she's a principal there in Crowley. But Stacy, she was so involved with my granddaughter, Kennedy, 
that she dedicated all of her time to her. It paid off. And it paid off. So what is she studying at TCU? She's going to be a plastic surgeon. Cool. And uh, she, you know, they sent me a, she's trying to get into a pre-med uh, uh, pre school. Huh? And she's got enough credits to be a senior. But my daughter, Stacy, she wants her to go to four, four years. So the university is called uh, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. Okay. It's probably the number one pediatrician hospital in America. They are having children that come in there, college students, and they uh, go through the summer and stuff for pre-med uh, training and stuff. Only two kids, college students from Texas, is being looked at. A girl from Baylor University and my grand. Oh, that from, is awesome. From Kent, from a, a TCU. And I just hope, you know, I talked to her. She called me this morning right before I come up, up here. I told her what I was going to do. And, you know, she always, she talks and I can, she used some words that I can't comprehend <laughs> sometimes. She's a very good speaker. Uh -huh. So she called me the day before yesterday, and she was in Nashville, Tennessee. Wow. With, yeah, she was down there with my other granddaughter. She graduated from uh, North Texas about two years ago. Well, she was down there. She was on spring break. So, uh, you know, she, uh, she uh, uh, called me, and she's got a habit of the Starbucks coffee. <laughs> and uh, I tell her, I said, it's, that's too expensive. And I called her yesterday. I, she said, I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm calling Uber to go down to Starbucks so I can study for my interview. That girl, when TCU and SMU played, they call that the Battle of the Metroplex. I said, were you going to the game? She said, no. I said, why not? She said, I'm going to study. Homecoming. She didn't go to homecoming. I'm going to study. Well, she moved out of her apartment about a month or so ago because her roommate, she got up that night to go to the restroom and found this boy coming out the restroom. And she moved out because she said she can't get us no sleep because they was too loud. And she can't study there. Okay. So where's she living now? She living off campus with one of her friends now. Oh, good. But, good. Uh, well, we I mean, keep she, her in our prayers well, for success. Yeah, she's, well, see, she went to, uh, they got a, a plastic surgeon down in Miami called, they call him Dr. Miami. Okay. He's the top, one of the top plastic surgeons in the United States. She's mentored with him. She's been down there to visit with her. And she, he's going to mentor her once she get out of college. Awesome. But uh, she is, um, she's got very good study habits. Very good. Well, more than what I ever would have thought of. Right? Because my daughter, she was, she was sharp. You know, mm -hmm. she, they all went to school here. And of course, my oldest daughter, that before I got married, she, uh, she didn't. She went back. She graduated from a uh, down there in Austin. Austin Westlake, okay. and she's now she's living in Dallas. She is a, one of the managers for Fatty Mac. Oh, so, really? Yeah. Okay. And my son, he's a he is a district manager. My young, my oldest son, he's a district manager for Aaron's Rental. Okay. And then, of course, Miranda, the youngest one, she works for uh, home. Not Home Depot, but a, a loan depot where they make house loans and stuff. And my son, he works for Western Finance, and he's doing very well there. Yeah, he was called me the other day, and he's got a big profit share that he was really amazed. Amazing. I wouldn't have never dreamed of it. Well, let me ask you, out of everything that you've done in your life, what are you the proudest of? What's your, your proudest accomplishment? One of my proudest accomplishments, when I went in the military, see, they always said, you know, draftee, back then I was a draftee, 
or maybe you might want to call it a draft dodger because I've done everything to stay out the military. Well, when they looked at my, they made me a personnel specialist. And in the, in the military, you have what they call an IG inspection, which is one of the toughest inspections that you can go through. And I was put in charge. The motor pool, everything had to be the orderly room, the morning boarding report, and I got a superior rating from the battalion commander. I got a letter, and I got that letter posted at my house right there. That's one of the biggest accomplishments that, uh, you know, has been in the military and was ahead of, it was probably 100 in my company, and I was chosen, and I thought that was a big step compared to my education that I had. But uh, that meant a lot to me. That's in the inspector generals. Yeah. It's pretty tough. It's pretty tough. Yes. And I got a superior rating on it. That's How many people were you supervising at the power plant when you were there? Well, see, at first, we had a maintenance supervisor, electrical supervisor, and an INC supervisor. Then they went to two supervisors in the shop and one supervisor in maintenance in the electrical shop. And the electrical shop was combined with the INC. When I took over, I had, they made me support supervisor. So I had all the maintenance guys, all the electrical guys, in the INC. So, once we got for an outage there, we would get help from other plants to come in and help us. And sometimes I might have as many as 25 or 30 people under me that I had to supervise doing outages and stuff. But on a day-to-day base, they had it where some of the guys on operation, on their days off, if they wanted the overtime, they could come down and work maintenance. So, you know, on a day-to-day, I would say anywhere between 8 to 12 people. That's after they down cycle. Back when I went to work out there, they had about 40 or 50 people yes, working sir. out there. Now they got probably 18 out there. Two plants still got two plants, but it was a, and it was a good job, and I, you know, and I, I guess uh, the hardest part of being supervisor for me was was dealing with people. The job wasn't hard because I knew the job. I knew the plant and I knew the equipment and stuff for dealing with people because people have a tense to try you. But I found out early stage, if you take care of your people, they'll take care of you. And that's a fact. That's good. Um, since this is your area of expertise, uh, I guess my question was going to be with the new technology they're trying to employ, the wind farms and things like that, uh, do you feel like will it ever eventually uh, transfer over to that type of technology? Or do you think lignite plants things like that are going to continue to be the mainstay for a while. Lignite plants will not be the mainstay because uh, we had a lignite plant there at right outside of Mon- uh, uh, Mahal, Big Brown. It shut down. It ran out of fuel. Okay. Monticello is outside of uh, Mount Pleasant. It shut down. Now, Lumina have lignite only have two it's Martin Lake and Oak Grove the wind mills is taking over the wind mills and what they call steam turbines they're going to be and of course we have a Comanche Peak the two, lign- uh, two nuclear plants down there they are 
But I look for these wind farms to continue. That's just my thinking, what I've seen. Yes. Of course, you don't see a lot, but go west. Get Abilene and start going toward El Paso. And it's thousands and thousands of them. And what kind of plant is Graham again? Graham plant? Yes, sir. It, it, we burn, we burn a, a, a natural gas and we burnt fuel oil. That's the last job I had out there. We was transferred from number five fuel oil, was, which was like by like Brother Rabbit served, to uh, number two, which is a diesel. And they began, they had to get, well, all this started behind that big blackout we had last year with that big freeze. Yes, and uh, now we, they got, they get trying to get where they can run full load on a, on oil, what we call oil, but it's, it's diesel, number two fuel oil. But they've been next to it a good place. And I give uh, Greg Stuckey, I don't know if you know Greg Stuckey, but I give that, that guy, he worked his butt off. And that's why those plants are still running today. Uh, I don't think we asked you earlier, how long were you in the military, sir? I was two years. I was a drafty, draft. At that time, you know, two years, and that Vietnam was hot. <laughs> and I wanted out as quick as I could. So I got out, and me and my little brother, we both was overseas at the same time. At that time, I was stationed, stationed in Oxford, and he was in Bamberg, and that's one of the biggest, biggest bases there in Germany because they had Air Force and Marines and all of them there, and he was in artillery. And of course, I was a stevedore, but once they found out that I had some college behind me and I could type a little, that saved me. <laughs> I moved into the oily room and, yeah. Really admire and respect all of your accomplishments. If you had to say something to this generation about how to be successful, what do you think it would be? I would tell them the sky's the limit. Because uh, uh, I, I tell myself, I've got an excuse why I'm not the brightest, the bloomingest flower on the sun. Because I didn't have the opportunity. But nowadays, all kids have the opportunity to get an education. What kids much, when I was coming up, my daddy would tell me, well, you need a high school education. That's all in the past. High school education don't get you nothing nowadays. You've got to have something on paper. And I would tell them, you know, that uh, uh, no one can hold you back now. You can lay it on whatever you want to, uh, you know, we have, I know, we have some people, they want to rely on, uh, you know, uh, diversity, you know. But, you know, that only goes so far. The bottom line, you got to apply yourself. And you you can't, you know, I tell people a lot of time, they'll quit a job. Well, I wasn't going to do what the man said. I said, I worked out there at the power plant for 35 years. I said, do you think I got where I was by telling my supervisor what I wasn't going to do? But you got them nowadays to do that and walk off the job. And that's the reason I tell people, you know, no job nowadays is a career job, which I don't think so. And uh, But, you know, you've got to go and get Education is the name of the game. If you ain't got it, you know, and you know, my brother, my oldest brother living, Ernest, he graduated from Lincoln School. He went off to college, North Texas. He didn't stay there a whole semester. He was nowhere ready for college. But, you know, he survived. 
He worked for Dowell, and he'd done several things, and, you know, he made a decent living. And then, you know, that's me. I, you know, I, I, I apply myself to be smarter than what I really am. I'll put it that way. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, you, know, I, you know, I learned to listen and learn. But I would tell this generation, the sky's the limit and all the education that you got, can get. And well, who inspired you or what inspired you to achieve what you've done? I guess my parents, because I seen what they didn't get. I remember when my mother, when she was working for Gene Glass. Gene Glass used to have a used to be copper and glass motor company, and my mother would take in ironing. They would go hunting. She, we would pick dove, whatever, to make ends meet. And I always told, and my son used to tell me, when I grow up. I'm going to get me a job at the power plant. I said, no, you can do better than the power plant. If you go to power plant, go for a superintendent. Don't do like I was. Don't go like well, I, I, I was a certified welder. I was a machinist. I've I, I, I been in school to all of it. Asbestos abatement, competent person, all of that kind of stuff. Well, that's an old blue collar job. I mean, nowadays, get something that you can't. Well, you use your brains and not your body. That's good advice. I've learned that since, as I've gotten older. It's better to depend on your brain than your body. Exactly. And see, like I said, you know, I, I, I worked hard. I mean, like I said, you know, I mop clothes. I clean commodes. I've done it all. Mow grass, trim hedges. But I worked myself up, step by step. And when I left that power plant, and right now, I'm one of the only, I go out there, and they're all glad to see me. All the guys want to come work for James because I treat him with respect. And, and, you know, I don't care. You might be boss all the time, but they're still human beings, and they do respect. I don't care what level they are. And, I, you know, I tell some people, we got a bunch of contractors out there. They might be contractors, but they're human. And you just can't talk to them. You know, like they got a tail. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, if you, like I found out, if you take care of your people, they'll take care of you. And that goes a long way. You know, I don't know if you remember Eddie Robinson. Used to be the coach, coach for 58 years down there at Gremlin. They interviewed him on TV. And they asked him, they said, out of the 58 years of coaching, what is the most, what was your best experience? What did you actually learn? And he said, I learned to win without bragging, and I learned to lose without excuses. And I looked at that, I, I think about it all the time. I mean, you are who you are. Nobody else can make you. You gotta toot your own horn. Anything else? He's answered. All the ones I before I could even ask them, mostly. We appreciate you so much. Well, this you're is, so welcome. This, this makes our museum that much better. Okay, uh, I'm glad I was yeah. able to help. <laughs>